Hello, and welcome to the Canadian Bowler Show. I am your host, uh, Daryl Fitzgerald. As you will notice today, if you've been to the show before, I am solo. I am by myself. Um, unfortunately, due to some unforeseen circumstances today, uh, Luke Caldwell won't be able to join me. Um, so you've got me today, whether that's good, bad, who knows, <laughs> uh, will uh, remain to be seen. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, uh, first get some housekeeping out of the way. Uh, please, please, please uh, like, uh, subscribe, uh, hit that little notification bell. Uh, make sure you follow us on Facebook and on Twitter as well. Um, follow our content. Let us know you're out there. Let us know that uh, um, you're seeing our show, that you're liking the content that we're putting out there, and that you appreciate the stuff that we do. It means so, so much to both Luke and myself, and it keeps this uh, keeps this show going. It keeps uh, our, uh, I guess, our drive going to keep putting out content, to make more videos, uh, put out some more live shows, and uh, to keep that uh, after... Um, Canadian Bowler After Dark going, uh, which is our brand new show as well. Um, so far, we've had some really, really great feedback on this show and on other shows and on some of the segments that we do, like uh, Coach's Corner, uh, Luke's uh, little rundown in our interviews as well. Um, it's been it's been fantastic. So thank you for all your support. Thank you for everything that you guys do for us to keep us motivated and to keep us going. So with that out of the way, uh, all our information is in the description below if you want to check it out. Uh, we also have a, uh, an audio podcast. We're on all major podcast networks, uh, Stitcher, Apple, Google Podcast, uh, and Spotify. And uh, I think we just broke 200, uh, 200 people listening to our shows. So that's fantastic as well. We've hit some major, major milestones, and we are that close. And I am being very, very little that close hitting 400 subscribers on YouTube. Uh, our goal is 500, but hitting that 400 just means we're going in the right direction. So thank you, thank you for all your support and, and everything that uh, uh, you sent to us and share with us. It's, it's fantastic. Um, I wanted to start the show off with, uh, I guess I, I don't want to turn this uh, into a, a sad show or anything, but uh, a lot of stuff has happened in the past couple of weeks uh, and this month and over the pandemic. I know that a lot of bowlers, a lot of clubs, a lot of um, families and friends and people that I know all across the country and overseas have been struggling as a result of this pandemic. And I just want to uh, reach out to everybody that's watching the show. Um, if you share it and if you see this afterwards, Please, 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 if you're having trouble, if you're going through things that you don't think you can go through alone, reach out to friends, reach out to family, reach out to club members. For, for my friends and family and those that have my contact information and everything, reach out to me. Uh, I'm always willing to talk. We're always willing to, to help each other out. We've seen clubs that are on the verge of shutdown that need support. We've seen um, provinces and states and other places open and shut and uh, have second waves of this stuff, which is hard on everybody, whether uh, it's financial, emotional, um, family that are struggling with it. So please, please, please make sure that you you reach out to those that are close to you and get support. Um, support is very, very important during this time. And also we've lost a lot of people. Um, I know for my club uh, specifically, uh, Ann Patterson just passed away. Uh, David Milne, who was the treasurer on our board, uh, passed away suddenly um, under very sad circumstances. And uh, I want to give a special shout out to uh, Chris Stadnick. Uh, he was actually booked to to be on the show a couple times, and uh, he's been super, super gracious uh, to us in in trying to get him on and doing stuff. But unfortunately, his mother passed away as well. So uh, Chris and Ryan Stadnick, Ryan's been on the After Dark show. Um, Condolences from the show. Condolences from me. Uh, we hope that you're doing okay. We hope that everybody that has lost somebody uh, during this time, whether it's to COVID or to other things, um, that you're doing okay. So uh, keep those people in mind uh, as you're going forward. Uh, with that, um, I kind of want to see what we can do with the show since I'm doing it solo and I can't discuss stuff with people. 
I reached out um, and asked people to send in information about stuff that they've heard during their time in bowls, whether it's as a new bowler, as someone coming into the sport, um, or as someone uh, who's been in the sport for a long time. Maybe you've run into it uh, years down the road. Bad information, the myths that get perpetuated, the old wives' tales that uh, for some reason just keep uh, going and going and going and are passed down through generations of bowlers and, uh, and never really get corrected. Um, bad coaching, bad training, bad uh, whatever. What are the what are the stories that that kind of get to you and say, you know, why is this happening, or why wasn't I told this when I started out? Um, why why is this information just continually going forward as if it's uh, you know the honest truth or gospel or or whatever it is um, when um, maybe it's not totally true. Maybe it's partially true. Maybe it has some uh, validity behind it, but uh, might not actually be true. So we got um, a fair amount of responses. Uh, I will be going through those today and uh, talking about them. And I hope that if you're in the chat, if you're listening, um, you know, uh, talk to me, reach out, send something uh, to let me know that you're there. And, and if you have some answers, I'll be happy to discuss them on this stream and, and get to them. So one of mine, uh, one of the things that I, I ran into early on in the game, and I, I couldn't quite understand it when I when I started, and it does have some validity. It, it does actually get you on the right path, but it's not the be-all, end-all of uh, picking your bowl. If I grab my bowl here, and early on I'm told... Take a bowl and do this, okay? If your hand can fit around it, this is the bowl that you should be, or this is a good size for you, or this is whatever, right? If you notice for me, my fingers overlap. It's not that bad. You know, this is probably a good size for me. Um, what I always say is that's kind of a, that's a half measure. That gets you part of the way there. Um, I see a lot of people do that, and it's like, okay, that's a good bowl, and I'm just going to go with that, and never question it, never go forward, never actually um, figure out what they want to do. Uh, for me, it's a good starting point just to kind of get that size to say, hey, you know, I'm not like this, trying to pick up a bowl, and I'm not like this. Um, it's, it's a good starting point, but you have to go out there and try your bowls. See if you like them, see if you like their bias, see if you like the grip, if you like the shape, if you like the, uh, the make and the model of your bowl. There's so many out there. There's slim profile, like mine. Uh, my bowls have a, a slimmer profile than most. Some are a little fatter. Um, I used to bowl with a size 5, and they were fine. They were comfortable. My, my hands fit around them. But uh, I, I use a size 4. It's more comfortable. It feels better. I had to go out and try fives and fours and see which ones worked. And, and I finally found the set that really, really um, fit my style of game, for one, and also um, my hand size. I don't have, I have pretty thin fingers. I don't have uh, big mitts to, to grab big bowls. So that's one of the ones that I was told on early on. And I think uh, a lot of bowlers should understand that when you're cho choosing your bowl, be careful. Try bowls, ask people to try their bowls, figure out what set you like. Color isn't everything. If you don't get the color you like, maybe you can get something close. But you want ones that are going to be good for you for years, because you're going to have them for years. A lot of people uh, that take golf um, seriously, for instance, go to Golf Town or go to other places, and they hit ball after ball after ball with these clubs as a trial. They're not just going to pick up a set and say, hey, this looks pretty good, and you know that's, that's kind of my length. I'm just going to take these and go. You know, maybe the weekend golfer will. Maybe for me, who who can't hit a golf ball to save my life, that'll be my my go-to. I'll just pick up the cheapest set and go. But that's one extreme. The other one is you got to try those. You got to try those bowls out and and see what they fit. Uh, Ralph Ellis in the chat. Uh, my favorite: polishing your bowls and adhesive makes them go faster. So polishing them with an adhesive makes them go faster. Oh. I get it. So if you're polishing your bowls, they're going to go quicker. They're going to go faster. They're going to they're going to be better. That's, that's a pretty good one. Um, RT Harrison, how to be a champion at bowls? Uh, don't wear glasses. 
don't wear glasses. Does that make sense to anybody that wears glasses? Some people can't wear contacts. Some people wear, uh, everybody wears sunglasses, right? <laughs> uh, let's see, I've, I've got a, a message from uh, Leon Franklin. And this, I found this one, one interesting, and I kind of want to discuss it uh, on this stream as well. So uh, she had a couple stories, but one of them was, uh, while marking at the Canadian Singles Championships, a player came to inspect the head and casually asked what I would do in this situation. Of course, she says, within earshot of an umpire. Um, I responded, I don't know. I think there is a reason you're playing in this game, and I'm just marking. Right. So basically, why are you asking me my advice? I'm just a marker. You're the actual one in this championship game. Um, she does suspect that it was uh, a smart mental trick by the player to take a breather and to think about the situation and options as if it uh, was from a different perspective or a different set of eyes. So that's, that's a fair assessment. Um, I do hear, and I want to discuss this because um, we actually ran the singles at my club and there was uh, a good chorus run uh, by Nick Watkins uh, to talk about what a, what a marker should and shouldn't do. So good markers are usually um, barely seen or heard from. They they usually stand off to the back so they're not interfering with the head. And they only answer questions when asked. So you can say, you know, am I shot? They can say yes or no. Um, am I holding two? They can say yes or no. They can give you kind of a distance. Hey, was my last shot? How far away was my last shot? They can maybe give you a distance identifier for that, that kind of thing. But they're not going to give you advice. They're not going to say, hey, I think you should cover the back. Or, hey, uh, uh, you know, I would make a drive in this situation because uh, you've got everything in the back or or whatever it is. Um, it's interesting to see the different kind of markers, those that have been trained and those that haven't been trained. Um, I've been in uh, situations where I'm kind of on the receiving end or I'm on the other side where a marker is cheering for one side or the other. So I've played where the person really wanted me to lose, I guess, or really wanted the other person to win. So they were uh, silently cheering on the sidelines for every shot that the other person made um, and not me. And they're also, you know, clapping for good shots by the other person and not me. And they uh, are also giving information. So in one head I can think of specifically, um, I'm making a sh my next shot regardless of what the other person does, um, other than cover the back, is going to be a drive to try to take that jack back. Um, I have everything in the back. My chances of getting four are high. My chances of getting three are, are pretty good if I hit that shot. And the marker is actually indicating to the other person to cover the T. It was respot. So to cover the T to actually take that away. Um, that shouldn't happen. So, yeah, interesting stories. There's, there's probably a lot of people that have interesting marker stories, whether you are a marker and weird things happen in the game, or you're a player and weird things happen with your marker. Uh, there's a lot of that stuff that, that actually happens. Now here's a good one uh, from Patrick Duffy. He's a, a US watcher. Uh, I believe he's in the Brooklyn area, if I'm not mistaken. So he plays up in the uh, Northeast area. Uh, Patrick says, uh, was told nonstop to stop chasing my bulls. Uh, I will never be any good f uh, and because of chasing my bulls, I will never be any good. And he heard this for years. Even uh, when he won the U.S. Open singles against a loaded field, he beat Keith Roney. If you're a Canadian, you know who Keith Roney is. He won the, uh, the pairs with Ryan Bester, the world pairs. Um, in the finals, uh, just coming off of his Commonwealth uh, win, uh, Bulls USA magazine had me on the cover. And instead of saying the young American beats a deep field, it had young bulls chaser. Patrick Duffy wins singles title. The magazine even had letters on it from folks who said they can't stand me chasing my bulls. Uh, chasing my bulls is not done out of hubris or to brag that I can still run. It's an implicit part of my game. Uh, it keeps my blood flowing, heart racing, and I uh, love to see the actual visual of how my bull finishes at the head um, instead of asking. Um, so there are strategical reasons as to why I do it. It has nothing to do with the pace of play. Games uh, I am involved in are usually the first off the green. I'm very, very fast, even though I do go to the head uh, quite often. <clears throat> Ralph likes to uh, uh, say something here. Uh, chasing bulls would eliminate the entire Scottish national team. Um, so 
Chasing bulls is always a contentious subject, and it depends on on who you talk to, where you are, and um, uh, possibly uh, what country you're in as well. Um, lots of people chase their bulls. It's not an uncommon thing. I used to chase my bulls all the time. I don't now, but it's like Patrick said, that's an implicit part of his game. Uh, for me now, I found that chasing my bulls um, took away from my game, so I don't do it anymore. I, You'll catch me on occasion doing it, but I try not to. Um, it's it's a matter, the importance of chasing your bull and the importance of whether or not to do it is whether it does add to your game or take away from your game. Um, people just don't like it because you're you're running up and down the green. You're chasing bulls. You're um, possibly, they say you're a distraction. Um, it comes into issue when you're doing it at the wrong times. You shouldn't be up at the head like a, a lead chasing their bull that shouldn't be up the head, maybe. Um, a singles player chasing their bull before they're actually allowed to be at the head, that could be a problem. But um, chasing your, your bull, as long as you're behind the head, uh, when your bull comes to rest, shouldn't be a problem, right? Um, but there are a lot of people that, that hate it. And I've, I've seen that really disdain for that uh, issue. It's um, it's pretty crazy. Ralph says, you know, uh, either chase them all the time or not at all, right? And and that's that's a fair point. Um, if you're gonna chase it, you do it all the time. It's a routine. If you're not gonna chase it, don't do it. It's not a routine, right? Uh, when I do chase my bull, it is not routine. Um, it's obviously for me. You'll know it's it's a break in my uh, my mental game where I'm not uh, thinking through what I should be doing. I'm not following. Um, all the processes that make me what I think a good bowler. So it's, it's, um, if you see me chase my bowl, usually that's just a break in my mentality. Um, Owen Kirby, uh, junior bowler that I, well, I guess he's just a young bowler, a youth bowler now. Uh, I chase my bowls when I have a lot of anxiety or stress during a match. It helps me loosen up, and that's fair. If you chase your bowl because uh, you get a lot of stress or anxiety, and I know a lot of players do, uh, they're thinking about stuff way too much or whatever. It it can sometimes just break that. You're chasing your bull. You're focusing on something. Um, you're blowing off a little bit of that energy. Uh, that could be a big thing as well. So um, good point there, Owen. Thanks for thanks for tuning in and thanks for uh, for your first comment. It's his first comment, everybody. Um, but Patrick, I, I do hear this a lot. Uh, it it really depends on on who you are and. Uh, I just I just say if you're a little bit uptight and you, that worries you the most, I say just run with it. If they're really, really upset that you're running up and down the green and it's not against the rules, it's not breaking play, it's not slowing down the game, because those are all the different uh, uh, issues that you might face, then, then what's the problem, right? It's their problem. And if they are getting all stressed out and worried and, and want to say something, it's taken away from their game. They shouldn't worry about it. Just ignore it. This person runs up and down the green. As long as it's not interfering with you, who cares? Right? Um, I had one that uh, I wanted to throw out there. And uh, there's a, a bunch of people in chat. If, if you want to um, chime in on this, let me know. But uh, something I heard um, growing up in bowls is the lead is the weakest bowler. And that's something that I wholeheartedly disagree with. But uh, I heard a lot. It's like, oh, you're new to the game? Well, you got to lead. And, oh, you're, uh, you know, I've, I'm, I'm a better player than you are. I should skip, you should lead. Or I um, have more experience. I should skip, you should lead. Total pile of crap. Uh, pardon my French. But the... The idea is that the entire team needs to be strong. If you put your weakest player at lead, you're setting yourself up for failure. And this isn't a club game. This isn't a jitney where people are rolling bulls right up the middle and, and blowing stuff up and stuff is going everywhere. You have so many responsibilities as a lead to set your team up for success. You need an excellent lead if you're going to be successful. So I'm, I'm talking about... Interclub play, pennant, uh, 
state, provincial, uh, national, whatever you want to talk about as far as going up the ladder, um, the, the lead needs to be extremely strong. I've got a few comments here. Throwing the jack to preferred distance uh, is an underrated skill. Absolutely, Dave. Absolutely. It is an underrated skill. Um, throwing the jack to where your team needs it uh, is so important. It's, it's a skill that every lead needs to master. If you're going to play lead and you know you're going to play lead, you need to master that skill. Controlling the jack. You've got a couple bowls. Maybe you have two or three or even four. That jack is so important. It's your fifth bowl. Okay, it sets everything off. Uh, Ralph says, in my time, it was uh, hide the weakest player at second. Uh, that is where the English put David Bryant. Obviously, uh, David Bryant is not a weak player, and that's where, where he played, but I heard that too. So um, if you want to sum it up, weak players at the front end, strong players at the back end, right? Uh, John Simon, absolutely not. I believe the lead actually has to be the best bowler on the rink simply because the setup of an end is what will make or break. Um, I consider leading uh, competitively a compliment. And that's the way you should see it, John. If someone asks you to lead or you, uh, you fit the lead role of a team, uh, take it as an honor. Take it as a, as a challenge to you to be the best lead that you can to set your team up for, for success. You've got the jag. Um, you're rolling the first bowls. You can put pressure on the other team. You can set yourself up uh, that the second or the third, or or if you're playing pairs, the skip um, is playing position. Has less pressure on themselves. You're not scrambling to try to save ends. You're setting them up so that the other team is um, is stressing out about trying to keep up with you, right? Uh, John also says, I'm scheduled to lead at the Canadians should it happen in 2021, and those skills are what we'll need to win games 100%. Um, going back to uh, Ralph's comment about uh, the second being the weakest player, that's another thing that I, uh, I don't agree with. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, you, you just hide your weakest player at second. Um, it's, it's a terrible mentality to have. Um, on a force team, obviously, people are going to have good days and bad days. Um, you might not have four super strong players. You might have someone that's a little weaker. The way, and I'll, I'll say this out here, and you guys can agree with me or disagree with me, the way you set up a team is based off of the skills of the players. Where do they best fit? Right? If you want to be a great player, if you want to be uh, you know, top tier, going to nationals, going international, being on national teams, whether it's US, Canada, Australia, whatever it is, you need to have all the skills. All the skills. Uh, for Canada, we'll take a Ryan Bester, for instance. He can roll the jack. He can play singles. He can, he can draw. Drawing is what uh, is his bread and butter. He can play that slight overweight shot, which usually you'll find in the second or a third, uh, where they want to drag the jack or move something or push something. He's got that slight overweight shot. And then he's got the drive, um, which is a vice or, or a skip shot. Uh, generally, and he can play that anytime he wants. Do you you need all those shots to be good? And Ryan plays lead uh, for other players. He plays uh, different spots in teams. He plays skip as well. Um, it's not just being able to drive and be skip or draw and be lead. It's having all those skills and being versatile so that you can fit in a team. And if your team needs some adjustments, people can shift. Say, hey, you know what? This week my, my drive isn't on, but my draw is excellent. Maybe I'll slot down to second and let someone else go up to vice. Whatever it is. You need that versatility. Put people in the spots that are going to make them successful, not trying to hide them because they have weaknesses, I think is what, is what I want to say. Um, Ralph, the best professional lead of all time in Canada, Ron Jones, Tom uh, Bonus, Fred Wallbank, and Rick Matthews. Yeah. International, John Ottaway, Paul Foster, Brett Wilkie, and Rowan Brassy. And those names, you're not going to find a, uh, a weak player on them that he just threw out there. So thanks for throwing those out there, uh, Ralph. Uh, John, 100% for sure. If you can be dynamic in your skill sets, you should be able to be effective no matter what position. I've skipped a lot, but found lead and vice to be my best spots in recent years. Um, and Dave says, that's why I, I like... Uh, Aussie pairs and snowball tourney and then 
Hey, Luke, uh, Luke is on in chat. Uh, <laughs> I love you too. Love you too, Lucas. Uh, sorry you can't be on the show today. I'm trying to hold it down and do the best I can as a, a solo act. Uh, the verdict is still out on whether uh, this is going well or not, but uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, that's what I preach as a coach. Learn all the skills. Obviously, if if you're setting yourself up to be on a team and uh, to be part of a team, you might be focusing on something. So I, I might be part of a forest team, and I know that in this forest team, we have set ourselves up as um, someone skip, someone's vice, someone's second, and I'm lead. So when I'm out training, while I, I'll train skills and I'll try to improve every single one of my skills, I'm going to put a little bit more in the pot for lead. So I'm going to go out there and say, I want to do more jack throwing. Whereas if I was skipping, eh, maybe I don't want to do as much jack throwing um, or work on that skill. And I will throw more into this pot and I will throw more into this pot and spend 60% of my time on lead stuff and maybe 40% of my time on other stuff. I still want to hone all my skills to the best because if I need to be slotted into second, if I need to be jumping up into a uh, vice or skip, if there's an injury or a sickness or someone's having a really bad day, we can do that because I'm capable enough to do that. But I know that I'm going to be relied on to be the lead, so I'm going to focus on those skills and be ready to do those skills no matter what. Um, I, I just feel that people need to understand how important uh, training and practice and um, working on your skills is to be a complete team. It's great. Uh, the fastest way for a strong young player to get a powerful team is to offer to play lead. That can be true. Um, a lot of people are looking for a lead. It's something that a lot of people just don't uh, don't possibly want to do, don't want that responsibility. Some people are still in that mentality that lead is the weaker player, which is not true. Um, but uh, if you're a young player and you're a good player and you want to crack into some of the um, teams that are already formed, a lot of them are looking for leads. Um, I know uh, on the national team, uh, front end is always a tough one. Uh, you've got like um, a Ryan Bester who generally plays singles and and usually skips a spot. So it's that that front end that is always critical uh, to fill those spots. Um, we had Steve Santana that played um, lead for him and did a phenomenal job. They won a gold. Um, but when uh, he started to have a family and all that kind of stuff, uh, he transitioned out and then it's on the search for the next one. Uh, Robbie Law did that uh, and now he plays... Uh, he was leading for, for Bester, and now John Bazir is back uh, leading for Bester as far as the last um, uh, multi-nations went uh, before everything kind of shut down. And it's finding that right person to lead, uh, whether it's in the pairs or the triples or the fours. You need those key, key skill sets to be really, really effective um, and to be part of the team. Uh, there was another uh, comment that I saw, which was... Um, as a lead, and this kind of ties in, um, as a lead, I should roll my bulls, stand at the back, and shut my mouth. Now, I didn't hear it that harsh, but I heard something similar where it was, oh, you're the lead? Okay, roll your bulls, go and sit down, and we'll, and we'll take care of the rest when I was growing up. Awful, awful, awful advice. One, you can't, uh, you can't learn anything from the side of the ring. You can't talk to people. If you're a young bowler or a new bowler or someone who's, who's trying to learn the game, you can't learn anything from the sidelines. You need to be in there. Um, you're not part of the team. You're standing off to the side. Be part of the team. Be supportive. Be in there. Be a, a, an effective part of that group. What are you doing standing on the sidelines? That's, that's horrible. You have some 
of the most experienced players playing lead. Uh, Ralph threw up, uh, I think it was uh, Ron Jones and Fred Walbank. Uh, Ronnie Jones, legend in Canada. Um, his sons, uh, Ian and Kevin, are also phenomenal bowlers in their own right. Kevin's uh, won countless Canadian uh, singles and Canadian medals. Uh, Ronnie Jones uh, probably has forgotten more than most Canadian bowlers have uh, have learned over his lifetime. If he was going to lead, <laughs> you're damn right I'm going to take all his experience and all his knowledge and ask him what's going on, what should we do, how should we change, what what do we need to, to develop this head or develop this game. It's, it's amazing. So, uh, if you're a lead, if you're new to the game, if you're watching this stream, if you're watching this video and you are new to the game, be in the head. Be an active part of the team. Don't sit off on the sidelines. Don't let them push you out. You need to be in there to learn the game, to understand what's happening. Um, and then so you can adjust as a lead. So you can uh, take the information that you're getting from the game and say, oh, what's going on here? They're playing really well at short. Maybe I should go long. Right? Where some people might not be looking at that. It's always, always good to have it. Uh, uh, let's see, John. Uh, another one where I totally agree, agree, disagree on it. Uh, with my teams I've been on, the main thing is to stay engaged. If you're not communicating together, you're not able to do your job as effectively as possible. 100%. I think that summed it up quite nicely. Um, I've seen that so much at the international level. One of the most engaged leads right now is Barry Lester because he's a bit more vocal and has been a major factor in Australian wins. Leads are important. Front end is important. Teams are important. I think the, the emphasis here is not necessarily just leads, but teams. If you're going to play a fours, if you're going to play a triples, if you're going to play a pairs, be a team. Don't be two individuals. Don't be three individuals. Don't be four individuals doing your own thing. Be a team. And that means that everybody's engaged. Everybody's having a say. As a lead, you might not have anything to say. Everybody might be doing their job and the vice and the skip are controlling the game, setting the strategy, and everything is going well. Then you're fine. But you need to be there so that if things go wrong, if things are confusing, if the skip or the lead or the uh, vice is struggling to figure out what to do. Maybe you can just say a, a word or two and get them on the right track, right? It's really, really important. Um, I'll throw this out here for you guys. So one note I had down here is something that we struggle with uh, as a Bulls nation, something we struggle with as a, a whole Bulls community right around the world. The perception that the game is an old person's game. And this isn't something that you're told on the green. This isn't something uh, that people will show you in a rule book or it'll be part of your game, but it is something that I hear from people all the time. Uh, having this YouTube channel, having this, um, I guess, having this venue or this uh, ability to stream to hundreds of people, talk to you guys in chat. Um, and everybody that's going to be watching this video, I see comments on some of our uh, top videos, like uh, the video we have of Nick Brett making that shot. And you'll you'll type it through it, and it's like, why is why is the crowd so old? These are all old people. It's an old person's game kind of stuff. And when I talk to friends, when I talk to people at work, when I talk to um, just people I meet who ask, hey, what do you do? What do you... What are your interests? Uh, and I say, hey, I'm a national coach for bowls. I lawn bowl. It's one of my passions. Uh, they say, it's not an old person's game. Aren't you young for that? And I'm turning 40 this year. Okay, I'm not necessarily a young guy. But it's still that perception that it's an old person's game. I'm still not old enough in some people's eyes to be playing this game. But it's not true. It's not not true. Uh... See what John has to say. As a marketing guy, this is tough. This is why I've been trying to use a lot of younger ones on promoting the sport. With the average age internationally under 30, it is definitely changing. So it's interesting because I've seen some videos out there um, talking about this. Uh, I think Nevrata on his site has uh, a video that he put out there that got a lot of views. 
um, that was basically uh, going at uh, Bulls Australia or the Australian uh, um, way of doing things that they're marketing way too much to younger people. They're focusing on the under 25, the, the super young people promoting them up, and they should be looking at older people. They should be looking at uh, the retired folk, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and, and really focusing on that because that should be the bulk of where they make their money, make their membership, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, Dave on chat here says, an old person's game, hard stigma to break. I tried to promote as much as I can otherwise. The thing here is, it's it's an everybody game. It's not an old person's game. It's not a young person's game. It's an everybody game. This is one of the games that we play or you can play when you're 10, you can play when you're 30, you can play when you're 60, you can play when you're 80. As long as you are physically able, and in some cases, even with um, physical impairments, uh, we have uh, para bowlers and blind bowlers and, and people that have um, uh, severe uh, conditions that can still play. It's an everybody sport. We don't hit each other. We don't play physical. It is it is an endurance game because you're out there walking or whatever, but you can dumb that down to, or you can uh, shrink that down to uh, smaller ends, smaller games, uh, modify ba based on uh, people's ability. But as a grand scheme kind of game, it's for everybody. You can play young or old. Um, I played with my dad. Um and he had both knees replaced. He doesn't pull anymore just because he doesn't feel like he's physically able to. But up until uh, he was just unable to do it anymore, we played. We played all the time. And I see people out with generations of bowlers. Uh, one young guy I play with, uh, Jack Fowler, has Brian Fowler, his, uh, um, his father playing, and his grandfather Jack playing with him. It's, it's a multi-generational game. It's so wonderful to have that ability to play with grandparents, great-grandparents, if, if your family is set up that way where your great-grandparents are still, still around uh, with the great-grandkids. It's, it's an incredible sport, and it should be enjoyed by everybody, and it should be marketed. Well, I can't say marketing. I'm not a marketing guy, but it should be that inclusive. And on the side of that, it should be including uh, everybody. Everybody in the community can come out and play. And I hope that that uh, can change over the time. And I hope that um, we can really, really start to push that forward and get more people on the greens. Because I think it's a beautiful sport. It's something that I'm passionate about. Obviously, Luke and I have this channel to try to promote the sport and try to foster ideas of making the, um, the games better. And